Hi, my name is Nicole van Dijk, and we're going to talk about injury prevention and our shift towards robustness. So together with um, rule changes such as not being able to lift your elbow when you're heading in football and other components in ice hockey or youth ice hockey in Canada where you're not allowed to body check anymore, that, that's real important rule changes that has made the sport safer. And we are preventing those injuries by removing the ability or, or the occurrence of them. We're removing the exposure. Now, I would say that is how we generally think about prevention. So when we think about sports and exercise medicine and our injury and illness prevention, I think we have to understand what does prevention look like in, in, our, in our world. Now, there has been a lot of research in the last 30 years or so around this topic. Um, and I'm going to try and just disseminate or, or, or lead into some of the principles around all this research that has been done. It started back with Willem von Mechelen in 1992. It's often called the von Mechelen model, but the real name is the sequence of prevention. And very basically, Willem said, well, to understand what to do, we need, first need to understand the size of the problem, the magnitude of the, the issue. So we do that with our epidemiological studies, such as in, 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 in producing incidence and severity. Then we want to understand the risk factors or the causes for those injuries. We want to find a way or something that addresses those issues. And then we'll assess uh, step one or repeat step one and see if we've made the problem a little bit smaller. So when we say complex, I, I want to I really emphasize it's, it's not uh, complicated, right? So a simple thing would be baking a cake. There's a recipe. If you follow it and the instructions, you usually get a pretty decent result. It's complicated building a rocket ship. There's lots of physics and, and, and dynamics that you have to appreciate, um, lots of math that goes into that, but it's complex raising a child, right? As any of the parents on the, would know, um, or if you've seen um, some of these uh, um, um, little guys in action, um, there's no handbook for it, but there's a whole host of things that come together to produce an outcome. And sports, kind of the same. Uh, this is a clip from French rugby um with just a wonderful display of technique and skill. Um, and if you're watching the bottom of the screen, even the physio isn't uh, protected uh, in the world of sports. I, I love this clip, not only because of the rugby expertise and skills on display, but, um, and of course, this doesn't happen in other sports. And rugby, you run onto the field immediately. Um, and uh, sport is complex. Stuff happens. And we have to try and be ready for, the, for those events or prepare our athletes for that. Since we can't remove players from this exposure, what we're trying to do is mitigate the risk. <coughs> if you think about risk and performance, we often think of them as opposite ends of the spectrum, where we're either at high risk or low performance or low risk and high performance. But of course, we know that they happen in parallel, that you are often at your highest risk when you're um, performing at your best. So can we build a system that embraces that uncertainty, that grows from random events, unpredicted shocks, stressors, that that's actually good for the system, To um, that volatility helps us to become more robust. That is what we're aiming for. And I'm gonna try and explain how we could potentially look at that. Now, um, some of the early work by Colin Fuller back in 2017 is the most recent update. He brought some wonderful ideas from industry and essentially, it's these three stages, right? We, we want to do risk factor identification. And we usually do that through our epidemiological studies. We then estimate that risk. So there's a perception around what that risk uh, represents. Um, if you're not familiar with it, this was the initial idea, right? So you have your sweet spots where the amount of acute workload, so what I'm doing this week, is appropriate for your chronic workload. So what you've done over the last four weeks we're always doing that. Now, we don't want to get into a danger zone where what we're doing this week is just too high for the athlete and it puts them at risk. Now, um, regardless of all the criticisms, even this original paper, you can see the little black dots which are represent injuries happen everywhere. And of course, we are at times spiking our athlete to get that performance benefit. No one's saying that you're not. It, I, I believe it is still important for us especially to understand chronic workload, chronic fitness, the, the build up of load within an athlete, their fitness levels 
to allow us to understand what we can push at them with in a certain shorter period, in a training session, in a week, in a month. We also looked at rate of perceived exertion, a really good proxy for workload if you don't have a GPS unit or can't measure it in more detail. We didn't find a strong association. And the reason I really like this graph is um, uh, because it shows the variability. All of, So those five X specific actions that led to injury, but all of the non-contact injuries had a flexing trunk and an extending knee. All of the running injuries had trunk flexion, rotation, and knee extension. So we have to bring some of those elements into our rehabilitation and our prevention. Now, in the perfect world, this would be the scenario. The um, injured players in the darker um, um, shaded color there, the uninjured in the lights, so I'll just draw a line here on my hamstring eccentric uh, body weight strength. And everybody above that line is uninjured. So if, if we just get people this strong, that sh we should be fine. But of course, that isn't what happens. This is what we see. And these two curves almost completely overlap. So when I test a player at the beginning of the season, he could be kind of strong or kind of weak. I don't know if he'll end up in the injured group. Part of that was with this uh, World Health Statement that came out, probably one of my favorite moments in popular science. The World Health Organization made this uh, statement around eating processed meat and how it increases your risk of colorectal cancer. So if you're eating more than two slices of bacon a day, I don't know, that's a lot of bacon, I, but maybe, then um, you're going to increase your risk of colorectal cancer. We all kind of get scared by that. Maybe we should stop eating meat altogether. But if you look at the actual paper, Yep, there's the 18%. That's a pretty good uh, um, uh, tight uh, confidence interval. So that seems like a legitimate uh, finding. But we have to understand what our risk is in the first place. So with colorectal cancer, it turns out it's about 5%. A little bit less if you're a woman, but we'll go with 5 We apply our risk factor to that base rate, and it's not just addition. We have to understand that there's an odds involved. So when we do the math, our or risk changes from 5 to 6%. So that's the difference between relative and absolute risk. So the absolute change is just 1%. Now, cancer is a big deal. That might be enough for you. I'm going to keep eating my bacon. And this is called Bayesian inference. If you're not familiar with it, we have a prior probability, we apply a likelihood, and then we have a posterior probability. So if we focus on the Nordic hamstring exercise just for a second, and I know it's called a bunch of different things. I don't care what you call it. You can call it the Russian call if you want. Let's focus on, on, on using the, the current terminology. We know that there's some criticism around the mechanism of injury because we think that our hamstring injuries happen at high speed with hip flexion, knee extension, and targeting the biceps femoris long head. The Nordic hamstring exercise doesn't do any of that. It's low speed. It's a knee-based knee exercise. It targets the wrong muscles, apparently. Um, but I think we're, we've busted that myth a little bit with some of our new understanding around injury mechanism and knowing what we're really trying to achieve with our exercise. If we think about the, um, the first evidence for, for Nordics, by the way, it's probably 1994 um, and some work done in Iceland um, as Roald pointed out uh, in one of our tweets, but the real first reference to the Nordic hamstring exercise that I could find was 1880 in a book called Health by Exercise by George Herbert Taylor. So sometimes research just takes a long time to catch up on what clinically feels very relevant and very obvious. So that's a, that's a little uh, encouragement for all the clinicians. If you have some intuition about something, don't let it go. Um, and, and it doesn't ta have to take us 100 years anymore to build evidence around a good clinical practice. Then rehabilitation. So I'm going to just really focus on this a little bit. When we, when we did our screening or risk factor papers, we also were doing randomized controlled trials at Aspatar. Now, um, what we found was in our first cohort, we looked at four seasons and we found previous injury to be a risk factor. But that seemed to disappear, while well, it did disappear, in our next two seasons. So when we separated those out, like I mentioned, we had these randomized controlled trials. So even if you were in the control arm of the trial, everybody in our cohort was getting a really good rehabilitation effort. And what we think happened was, because our rehabilitation standards were so high, 
because we were controlling it to that manner, we potentially were mitigating against the fact that you've already had an injury. So it shows us, and we've seen this in volleyball in Norway and other places, if you do a really good effort in rehab, you can prevent injury. Our hamstring protocol is available online if you wanted to have a look and see how it might fit within your clinical setting. And that is where loading comes in. This is a long definition, but ultimately we're trying to optimally load the tissue by applying um, the right max, the, the right uh, load that maximizes their adaptation. And that could be dependent on tissue type, pathology, and what we're trying to achieve, strength, scar tissue formation, uh, muscular tendon unit stiffness, or neural reorganization. Now, where, where does loading fit in? What do we need to do? Well, this is still to me the best way to think about it. We need to change our idea of loading to optimal loading within the early phases. So we start early and it has to be the right stimulus to drive the adaptation we're looking for. That can be influenced by the frequency, the duration, the magnitude, the intensity. All of that will influence what we're trying to achieve. But ultimately, having an effect at a physiological um, and cellular level, which could be mechanical, metabolic, functional, morphological. So when you are applying load in your rehabilitation, think about what you're trying to do. Are you trying to address pain? Are you trying to improve tissue capacity? Are you trying to influence movement capabilities? Each of our strategies will have different aspects. But if you know what the goal is of what you're trying to achieve, and of course you can try and do more things than one thing at a time, it'll be really easy to decide what you do. Our strategies then is to achieve those outcomes, and it's closely aligned to achieving those goals. If we go back to this uh, Danish summary paper, we have high quality evidence for hamstrings, but not really for many of the other muscles. We recently um, did a a, a randomized controlled trial looking at the lengthening protocol, which really is a good example of early optimal loading, really low low eccentric load. Um, And that's really how I think about a lot of these types of exercise now. It's great ways to get the athlete going early, Um, In this randomized controlled trial, we found that there was no reason not to do it early. It doesn't really get you back faster, but it's certainly a good way to approach uh, or a good option to consider when you're looking for nice early load. Essentially, these were the pillars of our hamstring management or some of the components that I think would be important now. High-speed running, trunk control, neuromuscular control or some some, uh, response to unpredicted movements, We're still trying to create force development. So the force velocity capability of the player and eccentric strength is a big component. Now, the reason I say that is those same pillars are important for us when the player is not injured. These are the the components that the player is always uh, addressing, um, even outside of rehabilitation, but certainly in rehabilitation. So I really wanted to focus on that because I think we have such an important role to play in this injury prevention space if we do our rehabilitation well. Then lastly, um, the context is of course important. No player is the same, um, no situation is the same. And so when you're trying to build an injury prevention program, a robustness program I hope, try and understand what the conditions are you're looking at. Get someone that has a little more experience than you. To ask, just ask your players, ask the team, ask the coach, because otherwise you'll never make it fit. And that is what we're ultimately trying to do. We're trying to make sure we fit what we do into the right, um, um, into the right uh, um, ecological and contextual framework. So injury prevention works if we focus on robustness, make sure that we have performance and participation at the heart of what we do. We embrace that there is complexities and uncertainties, but we can still deliver really good risk profiling and really good monitoring of our players. We have a program that is more than a single muscle focus. We really want to be holistic in our approach and physiotherapists are in a great position to continue the work they start in rehabilitation beyond um, the return to sport phase and when they are injured, start early. And we want to create adaptation and adaptability. We want to have players that can have more than one uh, approach to achieving the same outcomes. And we want to make sure that they're building that adaptation into their ability to perform when they're getting uh, back to their sports or when they're participating at the highest level. Thank you for your attention.